in front of me. Um, good evening. Uh, welcome tonight. Welcome to tonight's segment of the Adams State University Faculty Lecture Series. I am Jess Scalardi, and in addition to my teaching responsibilities here, I now coordinate the lecture series. Um, I would like to make a quick plug first uh, for the next lecture event, which will be in two weeks from now, uh, featuring Alice Birch, professor in nursing, um, and that will be at 7 p.m. again, the whole 101. Um, and she'll be speaking on the health in the San Luis Valley. So this evening's event is presented by uh, Dr. John Taylor, professor of theater. Uh, Dr. Taylor has been teaching at Adams State since 1999 and is currently a co-chair of the art and theater department, um, as well as has been a very active uh, <coughs> voice and presence on the ASU campus, um, especially noting all the activities he has coordinated this week. Interestingly, Dr. Taylor, along with uh, Dr. Jones, um, Emeritus Professor of Chemistry, um, gave one of the first um, of these lectures back when it was called a final lecture, um, <coughs> which sparked the creation of this series as we know it today. Within this lecture, Epson's A Dull House ignited a debate about what it means to be female and male. 140 years later, our understanding of human identity goes well beyond traditional ideas of gender and sexuality. This lecture examines the past, explores the present, and celebrates a future where every individual is empowered to live as their own authentic self. Dr. Taylor is joined tonight with Hannah Eubanks and Brandon Billings. Hannah is a third year theater major from Colorado Springs. She's currently playing the role of Nora in A Doll's House Part Two. Brandon Billings is a senior um, from Alamosa, who's playing Turval in the ASU production. So I hope to see you all in the next event, and I hope you have a wonderful night. In a play about a door, <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Tonight, our topic deals with one of the most radical and revolutionary developments in theater history, the age of realism, and one of the most controversial works to ever appear on stage, A Doll's House. Hendrik Ibsen's A Doll's House, which earns uh, the, the noted uh, subtitle, The Door Slam Heard Around the World. Tonight, we're gonna do a, a little bit of history about the play, but we also have a, few, a couple of special guests that we're gonna bring on in just a few minutes and you'll get to meet and talk with them as well. As a production style, realism began in the mid 1800s and it soon became the most dominant form of theater. And then eventually, if we do the timeline far enough along, it becomes the most dominant form of theater, film, and television. I mean, if you think today, even in sci-fi films, the great Marvel superhero films, the degree to which effort is put in to create a world which doesn't even exist, but to make it as believable and realistic as possible, I argue dates back to the beginnings of realism in the mid 1800s in the theater. The 19th century brought with it some of the most uh, significant social, scientific, and political changes since the Renaissance, and each of these had an impact which helped create and set the stage, if you will, for the age of realism in the theater. Among these different changes, the introduction of new technologies uh, revolutionized our lives, but the electric light bulb changed what we could do in theater, and if we're talking about realism, helps to make realistic effects on stage. Other things, urbanization and the rise of the middle class, there were shifts, significant shifts in political and scientific thought which questioned traditional beliefs. For example, the ideas expressed by Karl Marx in the Communist Manifesto, uh, Charles Darwin on the origin of species, and Sigmund Freud's introduction of modern psychology all challenged the status quo and became ultimately the tools, if you will, with which theater artists began to explore the world around us, but on stage. These changes made possible the age of realism, 
an approach that argues theater should depict truthfully the real world. Show it as it is on stage, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Mm -hmm. And in the early realism, realism plays, there was a lot of focus on the bad and the ugly. <laughs> um, so just briefly, what are the characteristics of realism that make it realism? And, and these are things that we're going to recognize not only in stage plays, but we're going to see in film and television. And, and if you go beyond uh, to video games today, and maybe the logical extension of realism being reality TV today, or even beyond that, I would argue, uh, when people are at home with their own camera on, filming their lives for people to log in and watch online. So the characteristics of realism are everyday language, right? If, if we're going to make the world look and sound like it does, then we have to let characters talk like they do. Uh, that means poor grammar, incomplete thoughts, interrupted thoughts. Gone are the days of iambic pentameter with Shakespeare and lofty language. Let people talk the way that they do. Contemporary sets. So while ours is a kind of simplified realism for the set for Doll's House Part Two, the idea is if you're going to have characters act and talk like they do in the real world, then you have to let them live in an environment that looks like the real world. So gone are just painted flats with a painted fireplace or painted books on the wall. We need the real stuff. We need it to be as real as possible to create the illusion that this is what the world looks like. Action began to focus on social and domestic issues, including honest portrayals of sexuality. There's a really famous play called Spring, uh, uh, Spring Awakening. Uh, that, that's a German play that took a number of years before it was even allowed to be performed because it dealt so frankly with teenage sexuality. Literally, this play has about every issue from A to Z that you can think of that they possibly could throw in. Later became a hit musical in the 2000s. Uh, depictions of violence became more graphic, more real for good or for bad. And other problems of society are addressed in realism. There's a focus on environment and psychology to explain character behavior. So not totally, but gone to a large degree are just simply one-dimensional characters. We have the hero who's the hero because they're good. We have the villain who's the villain because they're bad. And we have to have no explanation for their behavior. But in the age of realism, we need to know the backstory. We want to know what choices or uh, uh, actions happened in the past that impact their behavior today. That's why actors walk around saying, what's my motivation? What's my motivation? Why am I doing this? And then another characteristic is the common person. You and I become the subject of plays on stage. We don't have to be Greek heroes. We don't have to be Shakespearean. Uh, uh, historical or, or figures of royalty, you and I are good enough to have our stories explored on stage. So the introduction of realism to the theater meant that everything changed. Everything changes, including, interestingly, the approach that we teach to acting. Um, if you've ever heard of the great acting teacher and director uh, Stanislavski, his work began out of the early days of realism. Realizing that the work uh, as an actor, what he was doing earlier, just didn't fit the demands. It was too theatrical. It was too over the top. It was too melodramatic. How do we create a, an approach to acting, a psychological-based approach to acting? And that's what he explored, and it's still the same approach that we teach as a baseline acting approach 100 years later, 100-plus years later. So the old ways of creating theater were insufficient in the age of realism. Approaches to acting, playwriting, stagecraft, and more were all transformed because of the demands of realism. Written in 1879, Henrik Ibsen's A Doll's House is considered by many to be the play that ushers in the modern age of theater. And again, if you do the timeline, it ushers in what becomes the age of film and television where anything and everything can be a story on stage or screen. And it also helps to make realism 
the dominant, popular, and controversial form of performance. It's also viewed as a milestone in the burgeoning women's rights movement. So let's talk for a few minutes about who is Henrik Ibsen. Ibsen lived, not that I'm going to quiz you on a test, uh, from 1828 to 1906. He was a Norwegian playwright and known as one of the fathers of realism. He introduced to the stage complex characters who had multiple, even, even ambiguous motivations for what they did. And he placed them in situations where right and wrong weren't easily definable. In an attempt to depict humans uh, confronting the pressures of life, Ibsen did not avoid the darker side of human existence. And because of the kind of work that he did, it seemed that audiences either loved or hated him. There seemed to be no middle ground with Ibsen. Um, one of his plays, one of his most famous plays besides A Doll's House, is Hedda Gabler. This is what one critic said of that play when it opened. It is a hideous nightmare of pessimism. <laughs> the play is simply a bad escape of moral sewage gas. <laughs> and that was one of the kinder responses to that. <laughs> Without his approval, some of his admirers, and he did have plenty of them, named themselves Ibsenites <laughs> and championed social reforms using him and his name as a symbol of the, of the idea for change. One cause with which his plays have been associated is the early women's rights movement, which was gaining prominence as he was doing his writing for theater. Ibsen endeared himself to activists when he said, a woman cannot be herself in the society of the present day, which is exclusively a masculine society, right? But for himself, Ibsen also said this, I have never written a poem or a play to further a social purpose. I have been more of a poet and less of a social philosopher than most people seem inclined to believe. I thank you for your good wishes, but I must de decline the honor uh, have been, being said to have worked for women's rights movement. I am not even very sure what women's rights really are. So as I tell my students, never trust a playwright, uh, because they will be on one, you know, They'll, they'll, they'll say a lot of different things. But tonight we're going to explore A Doll's House, a play first performed 140 years ago, and a work that has created passionate debate and captivated the audience's imaginations for generations. So how many of you have read A Doll's House or seen it on stage or a film or a play version of it? Okay, good. So in every part of the world, uh, and in researching, you can find productions in Iran and in China and all of, I mean, literally all over the world, there are productions and variations of this play made into novels, into film, into new stage plays, into sequels. And there have been any number of directors, including myself, who have attempted to put our own unique stamp on this classic play. So let's quickly, for those not interested, or not, not interested, but not knowing about the play, uh, let's, let's give a brief summary of what it's about, okay? Maybe you can help me along if I'm leaving out any of the major plot points. So the play opens, if you recall, with a doll's house, right? Nora is coming home and she's been out shopping. It's Christmas time. She is enjoying spending money and buying presents because they haven't been able to do that for a while. Uh, her husband has been sick. Now the play doesn't necessarily say what the illness is, but everything indicates it's tuberculosis. They have recently come back from a trip to Italy where he's recovered in a, in, a, in a warmer climate and he's got a promotion. He's now the manager at the bank. Things are looking up for their family, uh, their three children and this couple. And Nora is celebrating uh, just the great fortune that has happened. And Torvald comes in and we see them for the first time. And as if you recall, Torvald comes in and says to Nora, oh, it makes me so happy to see you spending money and eating those, those macaroon cookies. And that's not really what he says at all. He says, stop spending money, my little spendthrift, my little squirrel, my little doll, my little child. He has all these nicknames. And by the way, stop eating the cookie, okay? Because you're my wife and I want you to look good. So we learn quickly about their relationship. 
And then we have visitors coming in, and through these visitors, we learn some things about what's really been going on. Torvald was sick. There was no way to pay for his medical treatment. So Nora does something that she shouldn't have done, or maybe she should have, and we have the play, right? Um, she forges a loan document. Now, she tries to get a loan to pay for the trip to Italy. Torvald wouldn't do that at all. He's not going to go into debt. He, he worries mostly what other people think about him. And so she, she gets a loan on her own, which a woman couldn't do. But the only way she could do it is she signs or forges her father's signature. She does it several days after he passed away and doesn't think about maybe dating the check before he dies. She dates, she dates it after, right? And so the whole play becomes a series of her attempts to try to keep her secret hidden from her husband because she worries what he will do when he finds out she did this. Uh, and, and in her mind, she really did nothing wrong except for saving her husband's life. But she has another character, Krogstad, who's blackmailing her because he wants to keep his job at the bank. Uh, I mean, truly, A Doll's House is realism, but it's also great melodrama at the same time. <laughs> and so the play plays out, and ultimately, the secret is revealed. It comes out that she forged the document, and um, Torvald discovers it, and he comes out and he says to Nora, Oh, Nora, what have you done? What have you done? Oh my goodness, I'm so happy, I will stand by you. That's not what he says either. <laughs> he comes out and says, Nora, what have you done? What have you done to me? What about my reputation? Oh my God, what will happen to me, to me, to me? And she's looking at him like she's never seen him before in her life. And they go on to have one of the great scenes in modern drama, this great debate about what it means to be a man and a woman, what it means to be a husband and a wife in a marriage. And at the end of it, Torvald says, look, you have done wrong, but we got out of this trouble because I have the loan document back and I'm gonna tear it up and destroy it. No one will ever know. So this is a great opportunity for us, right? You, you can't be around the kids because really you're morally corrupt. A woman that does something so awful as forging a document is a morally bad influence on the kids. But they'll be in the house, you'll be in the house, but we'll keep you separate, and not only will you be my wife, but you'll be my child. I will raise you and teach you what it means to be a good person and a moral person. And Nora says, oh, Torvald, that's all I've ever wanted, for a strong man to tell me what, is that what she says? No. She says, bye-bye, I'm out of here. And of course his response is, what will people say? What will but she leaves. It becomes the door slam heard around the world as she goes off stage, and you hear it off stage. Um, and she leaves, entering into a world in which she doesn't know how she's going to survive, where she's going to sleep next, what's going to happen. But she does it because she says, I can't be a good wife. I can't be a good mother until I know who I am, what I believe, what I think. And she goes out the door. The door slammed heard around the world. Now, a, a Doll's House premiered on December 21st, 1879. Days before that, week, two weeks before that, Ibsen had published copies of the Playtex because that's where he was going to make his real money. He could sell the play as a form of literature, right? People would buy the copies. And 8,000 copies of the play sold out in, liter in literary form. So people knew about the play, and they were waiting to see the opening night performance, to see what would happen. Would Nora really leave at the end of the play? And so on opening night, they're full house. It's sold out. And the play goes on to have lots of controversy because people, again, either hated it or they loved it. In truth, Ibsen's A Doll's House is based on a real story. It's based on the story of a woman named Laura Keeler. Uh, who was in the news and Ibsen actually knew. Her story is very similar to Nora. Uh, her husband had contracted tuberculosis. She took out a loan to help pay for a trip to Italy. They went, he came, they came back, he recovered, and she panicked. She realized she wasn't able to pay back the loan, so she wrote a hot check, she forged a check. When her husband found out, 
he too was so upset with the idea of a woman who we place on a pedestal as being morally virtuous, right? That, that if she did this, she must somehow be mentally ill. So he commits her to an asylum <laughs> where she suffers a nervous breakdown and after two years, he allows her to come back to see the children. So Ibsen knew about this and then wrote his play about that. It opened to sold out audiences. Many critics saw Nora's actions as scandalous, as shocking, but others cheered and applauded it. An 1879 review of the Social Democratin approved of the play and Nora's actions. Quoting the review, who after seeing this play has the courage to speak so scornfully about runaway wives? Is there anyone who does not feel that it is this young and delightfully young woman's duty to leave her husband who fails to understand her value as a human being? But another critic from the same production watching said, uh, Nora's leaving her husband and children is, quote, indescribably unnatural. It is foreign to what a woman should be and do. Now, it's been 140 years since Nora walked out the door and into a world that was unknown to her. Those final moments shocked some audience members, left others in tears as they cheered her defiant act of self-determination. It is truly one of the great moments in theater history. So at this time, I have a couple of guests I'm wanting to meet. Please welcome to the stage, Nora and Torvald. So that's the original ending. Uh, a year later, in 1880, in Germany, uh, the, the play was getting ready to premiere there. The leading actress in Germany, in, in, in the German theater at that time, was scheduled to play the role, but she said, I can't do it. I, I would never leave my children, and besides, my audience would hate me. <laughs> so Ibsen worried in this age before really strong, if any, copyright law, uh, what would happen? Uh, would another playwright come in and just write a new ending to his play that would make the actress happy? So he decided to take matters into his own hand, and he writes an alternative ending to the play. Um, and uh, we're going to go ahead and take a look at this one. So this is the alternative ending that played in Germany. Fine. Go then. But first, you shall see your children for the last time. Let me go. I will not see them. I cannot. Yes, you shall see them. Look, there they are, asleep, peaceful and carefree. Tomorrow, when they wake and call for their mother, they will be motherless. Motherless. <laughs> As you once were. Motherless. Oh, this is a sin against myself, but I cannot leave them. No. And she stays. <laughs> So this ending also caused protest at the theater, uh, and the actress eventually went back to playing the original, or played the original ending as written by uh, Ibsen. Now there is reportedly a third 
alternative version, not written by Ibsen, but also but done in Germany with another ending. In fact, this playwright added another act to the play, a short fourth act to the play, and we're going to show that to you as well. So in this German production, with an unauthorized extra text, Nora returns home months later with a new baby in arm. <laughs> <laughs> and as she comes home, she begs Torvald to forgive her, and Torvald pops a macaroon into her mouth, and she exclaims, Oh, the miracle of miracles! <laughs> and she stays. <laughs> So this play has a long history because people are conflicted about the basic action. Should she leave? Should she stay? What is a person's responsibility to herself? Now this play, you guys can take a seat. It took a decade before this play played in New York City uh, because the play was so controversial. So we're going to take a few minutes and do a little Q&A session with Nora and Torvald. We have, we have, as soon as they finish their... <laughs> we have an opportunity to talk with Nora and Torvald about the choices they made. Now, at any point you have a question you'd like to ask them, just raise your hand. Now, a little bit of ground rules. The Nora and Torvald you see at this moment and you meet tonight have not yet lived through part two. Uh, so if you haven't seen part two, we run Friday and Saturday at 7.30 and Sunday at 2 p.m. It's a show that I'm extremely proud of. I think the quality of acting in it is as good as you're gonna find at any four-year college institution. So please come and see the show if you have it. So just keep that in mind, that they're not gonna answer questions about what happens in the sequel, because you have to come and see it to, to find out for yourself. But let's start off with a question. Nora and Torvald, why do you think audiences have been so fascinated with your story? I think about the time it's unheard of. For a wife to leave her children, that's the biggest part of losing the children, I think. Do you think if you had left and had been the father, it would have been not such a big deal if you had walked out on your wife and kids? Hell yeah, it wouldn't be a big deal. <laughs> yeah. Nora, why do you think audiences? For the one time in my life, I will probably <laughs> it's just the history of it. Women were too afraid because it's unheard of. Yeah. <coughs> so, and again, if you want to ask a question, just raise your hand. Uh, for our audience, knowing what you know about their relationship, uh, would, would Torvald be the kind of husband or spouse that you would seek for yourself? No. Yeah? Anybody? <laughs> How's that make you feel? The biggest thing to me is my reputation. Okay. Yes. So Absolutely. if no one's going to honor my reputation, okay. why waste my time? I mean, think about it from this perspective. 1879, in many ways, Torvald is the dream husband, right? He's the perfect man. He's got a great job. He supports his family. Although you could argue, well, you know, if you get sick, is it your responsibility to take care of yourself so you can take care of your family and not worry whether you're in debt or not about that? But he is the perfect husband. He supports the family. So what more could Nora want or should want? Yes, question right here. Yes, Nora, if you leave, who is going to take care of you? Who is going to take care of me? Yes. I am going to take care of you. How? How can you possibly do that? <laughs> I will find a way. <laughs> there was a, yes, Elise. Did Torvald ever express any gratitude for the trip to Italy and the recovery of his health? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I was happy. Were you? I was. Mm -hmm. I came home to what I thought was a perfect life. <laughs> the only one was to take more of my money. <laughs> so, you know, let's, let, you know, one thing we should explain about the relationship, too. I mean, Torvald did take care of her. He, she, was, she got an allowance every week, so she had a little bit of money to spend. And what he didn't know, of course, was that she was paying back the loan very diligently and responsibly. But he assumed she was buying macaroons and, <laughs> and things for herself, right? It's a classic case of a couple who I think were playing the image of what they thought they should be as opposed to really talking with each other and, and listening to each other, right? Um, 
By a show of hands. Uh, yes, question, Caleb. Um, for both of you, you have been together for however many years and have had three children. Clearly there was a point in which you realized that the other person wasn't recognizing you as yourself, but also you might have been expressing what they wanted. When, in your years, because you've had three kids and plenty They've of- They've been together about 10 years or so. 10 years. years. Yeah. When do you feel like you started to fake it with your spouse? <laughs> and, and I mean this for Torvald as well. Communication is the key to any happiness. So when did that stop? <laughs> when did you forge the document? <laughs> it started long before that. When you're in a marriage with two people, it's what I was supposed to do. It's what I was expected to do. I went straight from my father's house to Torvald's house because that was what was expected of me. I played my role and I did what I could and I did love him, I did, up until I realized that he didn't see me as me, that he saw me as a thing he had, that he owned. Mm -hmm. did, you, did you see her that way? Did you see her as, as eye candy, as, as the trophy wife? As, what did you want from Nora when you entered into marriage? I wanted someone that was going to support me, starting off at the bank, working at the bank, giving back to my help, not lie to me, not go behind my back, someone to help take care of the kids, have a perfect family. But on my side, what I saw in your eyes was a giant dollar sign. So you don't think she supported you? I don't know anymore. You know, that's, that's probably a fair question, right? I mean, the question to ask is which was worse? The fact that Nora went behind his back and forged a signature to save his life, or the fact um, that he treats her the way that he treats her? Yes, Matthew. So Nora, building off of your answer, um, in a time of such constraints onto the roles of women and mothers, how did you gather the strength to make that decision? It became evidently clear to me after he realized that I had forged the document and realizing when he got the document back that everything was okay and he, he was ready to just go back to the way things were. Um, me being his little skylark, his little pet. And it was at that moment where I realized that he didn't see me. Um, and it made me realize that I did go straight from my father's house to his house, and I never had any time to figure out who I was without a man showing me. Yes? Uh, when your communication was starting to fall apart, did either of you ever consider telling the other you needed to have an honest conversation? The way the roles were in our house, there never was a time where we did have communication. In our eight years of marriage, it was Torvald is the boss, I follow along, I'm his spouse, that's what I'm expected to do. It wasn't until I was about to leave that Torvald said, no, let's, let's talk about it. But I was already gone. And there, if, you, if, if you know the play too, there's another character, Dr. Rank, who is a friend of both of theirs. And she talks about how they, she and Dr. Rank can sit and have honest and in-depth conversations, the kind she never had with her husband. So it's not a matter of that, that she didn't seek those things or was not capable of those things. As a couple, they weren't interested in that because they were both playing the roles. You were both playing the roles that you thought you needed to play, play the role that you thought she wanted that he wanted from you. <coughs> yes. Have a second one? <laughs> That's fine. Uh, Nora, do you have a daughter? I do. Are you setting a good example for her? I think that I am. Absolutely. I don't think, as a person, my sons or my daughters, that they can live 
successfully or truthfully in this world unless they see their mother do it. Leaving them was the hardest part, but if I don't know who I am, how do I expect them to find out who they are? Yes. So, Torval, how can you legitimize blaming Nora for the trouble that was caused when it was your own high morals that brought the blackmail down on both of your heads? <laughs> <laughs> It goes a lot back on the reputation. I had a promising job as the bank manager, and that's what I wanted. I wanted to support the family. Reputation was key to me, but after she left, I didn't know anymore. By a show of hands, I'm curious, how many of you, based upon what you know of the play, think that Nora does the right thing at the end of the play by leaving? By a show of hands, those that support her leaving. Okay, it's the majority. Now, those of you, that didn't raise your hand, would anybody be willing to say why you think she should stay, she should have stayed? Or if anybody could say why they think she should have left? Yes. Okay. So in class, when we were talking about this, we talked about how Torvald was being somewhat bipolar in his actions. Because when they were in the house, he would call her his little Scarlet and Spindlethrift. Spindlethrift and like, all these belittling names, like, you're my pet, I'm in charge. Mm -hmm. But in public, he always treats her with like, slightly more respect. Mm -hmm. But, like, he was being somewhat bipolar. Okay. Okay. Yes. Um, I think it's kind of a long side in a way, it's kind of like, not physical abuse, but like mental abuse. Because, like, you would tell her all of these things in the house and make her feel really bad, but then you would go out and you would be like, all loving, loving, and loving, mm -hmm. loving. Yeah, I mean, there definitely was no physical abuse in this relationship, but the, one could, I think, make a credible argument that there was a level of emotional abuse uh, when you're lectured to and you're, you're just harangued all the time about what you eat, what you spend, uh, and, and, and not respected as a, as a, as a, as a fellow adult, uh, but treated as a child. How long can you expect someone to stay in that marriage? I mean, they're obviously generations of women who have lived in similar situations and didn't leave. What makes her actions so bold and shocking is that she stood up and said, I have to leave and I'm doing this, I have to do this and I need to do this for myself, right? Um, anybody else a comment about why you think she should have left or should have stayed? Yes, Cassie and then Matthew. Nora should have left. I like that Nora left because she needed to find out who she was in order to become a better person for all those around her. She, she was living for the men around her when she needed to live for herself. Okay. I agree fully, but in Torvald's defense, you know, having children is a responsibility and, and it's, it's not right to abandon somebody. Yeah, and that become so I'll tell you I'll tell you something uh, from my own experience when I directed uh, this production of a doll's house in 2004 um, I didn't do it in the style of realism I did it in the style of expressionism expressionism it's probably the most experimental production I've ever directed um, and we toyed with the idea at the very end of having her two children we, we had two children we didn't have three one of whom was my eight year old <laughs> daughter at the time um, come and stand as she's leaving mm. so they're on the stage as Nora's leaving and I after one rehearsal I said oh, I, there's a reason why Ibsen didn't show the kids after act one yeah. because it makes that leaving really challenging because my production we were we were it, it wasn't black and white but we were leading the audience to, 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 to support Nora's leaving. Um, but having the two kids there watching, it, we couldn't do it because it just made it too, it made it too messy, too <laughs> complex. Yes, Dr. Lovell. Is any consideration, Nora, of taking the children with you? I thought about it, but then I realized that they would be better off with Torvald and with Anne-Marie, who would take care of them. She raised me. Um, and she was already raising them. I wasn't really a mother to them. I was more of just that fun figure in their life. I wasn't a role model necessarily. But thinking about taking them with me 
I had to figure out how I would support myself. It was very difficult to figure out a way to just support myself, let alone feeding three other mouths, taking care of three other mouths. Um, it was better for them. Yes? Knowing how mentally abusive your husband was, were you at all afraid that he would do that same thing with your daughter growing up and she would feel exactly the same way that you did to your father? That is a really difficult question. I feel as though it was a possibility and I felt as though when I could figure out who I was and what I believed, that then I would be able to pass that on to my daughter and hopefully influence her to be a strong woman. And as you left um, at that period, you didn't give up the idea that you might come back. Right. Uh, you, you said that to Torvald. This is, I don't want anything from you. I don't need you to send me money. In fact, here's my wedding ring. Mm -hmm. But when I find what I'm looking for, I, I very well may be back. And of course, Part two, she does come back through the very door that she exited. Yes? Um, I've always been conflicted about Nora leaving, and I'd like to know if either Nora or Torval had considered finding friends as a support system for figuring out what the hell their marriage was all about. I mean, that's something women have done and still do when they hit problems. And, and I don't know about guys. <laughs> I think Nora did try that for a little bit. She had Dr. Rank. Um, and I, I had Christine as well. And confiding in them, I still felt stuck. I still felt like I had to leave because though they got to experience the world and though they let me confide in them, I still didn't know anything for myself. Um, and then towards the end of our fight, we realized that Christine went back with <laughs> my blackmailer and um, that my friend Dr. Rank did pass away. So my support group did fall on her at the end. Torvo, how do you feel about that? I mean, in that final scene of, of Act Three, you guys are going and you're, 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 you're arguing, you're yelling in, in a doll's house, but, but, but you're also talking really for the first time. And you're seeing her in ways uh, that you've never seen her. And in fact, at some point you do say, said, I am willing to change, right? And we all know that uh, when a guy says, I'll change, he will always change, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but he says he will change. How do you feel about the fact that right at the moment where you're actually doing what she wants, which is to have a marriage in which you talk to each other, she then still decides to leave? I will admit a lot of what I did was wrong. I will admit that. I didn't pay enough attention. And maybe I did treat you the wrong way. But at the same time, I needed to be myself too. And talking to you, always notice you talking to Dr. Rank. Always notice. But I was willing to change. I wanted to. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe I was right. But we don't know. Because you left. I have a Yes, Matthew. Just one question for Torvald. Can you lead us through what it was like? Because you have a responsibility to care for your family and to provide for your children. What's it like to be ill and not being able to do that and then to finally come through and then and to be back in the situation where you can only to be um, realizing that your marriage is crumbling? When I was sick, it felt wrong. It felt like I wasn't doing what I was supposed to do. Being in a new location for quite some time was very different to me. I felt like I wasn't providing the way I could have, the way I should have. And when I came back home, that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to work. I wanted to be financially stable. Kayla. Well, you said many things to help encourage Nora to stay. Out of all those things, it 
didn't seem like it worked. Is there something that you could have left out in the sense of if you could go back and place another phrase to help your case, what would that be? That's a long one. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, by, my, by my mind, I might rephrase that. Um, what advice would you each give to yourself if you, if you could give to your younger self as you were getting ready to enter into marriage? What would you, what would you tell Torvald, what would you tell Nora as you enter into this, to this union together? <laughs> Don't. <laughs> okay, is it, uh, no. <laughs> no? okay. We're going to take one more. Let's take one more question, and because I want to keep us in the time frame for the lecture. But. Kat, can we have a question for Darvall? If <laughs> when you said you were going to change, and you really meant it, wouldn't you have changed to become a better man anyways, even though Nora left? You said you were going to change so Nora would stay, but if you meant you were going to change, wouldn't you change to become a better man anyways, even though Nora already left, in case she did come back? With that door shut, that's when everything changed. Realizing that I was the one that was gonna have to take care of the kids. That changed. Did that answer your question? I guess I'm a little confused with the question. Okay. Kind of. Would, would you be willing, if she leaves, if I'm understanding it right, when she left, um, are you willing to still try to be the man you said that you would be to her in those final moments? That's hard because when she left, I was broken. So there's a lot of different thought, thoughts that can land in my head at the time. So let's, let's kind of sum up some of what we've been talking about. Why is a doll's house such an important work? With its door slam heard around the world in 1879, Ibsen's A Doll's House ignited a debate about what it means to be female and male. Now, a lot has changed since then, of course, and, and a lot has not happened as well. For example, it's nearly 100 years since American women were guaranteed the right to vote by the 19th Amendment, yet we have still not elected a woman to the highest office in our land. Uh, it's 40 plus years since the Congress of, of approved the Equal Rights Amendment, and it's not been approved. There's been a lot of positive change, and there's still been a lot that's not happened. 140 years later, our understanding of gender has changed in ways that Nora would never even recognize or even imagine as we recognize that human identity goes beyond traditional binary ideas of gender and sexuality. Now, it's not a secret that I am, I am drawn to a doll's house. As I mentioned, in 2004, I directed this play in this space in our spring slot. And when I learned that Lucas Nath had this new play, I knew I had to direct it, especially because the sequel, his sequel, his version, uh, takes place 15 years after Nora walked out the door. It is 2019. So the symmetry is perfect, right? 2004 and then uh, 2019. It's exactly 15 years since my original Nora walked out. Um, but I also knew that I needed and wanted to direct this play for another very important reason. Out of a sense of profound concern for the current state of our nation, against every expectation for the new century. We, I believe, are in danger of losing our forward progress towards justice for all, equal treatment under the law, gender equity, and the eradication of racism and homophobia. So in response to this, I saw the opportunity for a new theater project that confronts what is happening in our country as well as explores what we need to do to move forward so that we can create a more just and perfect union. The original and its sequel share many connections, including the idea that each play is a passionate, a passionate plea for human rights for all through the power of choice. 
These works speak to the basic right to choose our own life. A doll's house, part one, part two. They are about individual freedom and the right to live our lives as our own authentic and autonomous selves. I think that's part of the issue that you've all faced in, the, in, in your marriage, right? You were playing the roles that everyone else expected as opposed to being your authentic self. Both plays function as debates about what it means to be sovereign human beings acting with self-determination. In each, the characters are struggling to define and, and, and shape the kind of world that they want to live in, and by extension, the kind of world we will live in a hundred and some years later. True, the plays do operate as a kind of battle of the sexes, and that's part of the draw of, of both part one and two. But I believe that these works speak to any person, to any person who has ever risked losing everything in order to gain oneself. For every person who has ever walked through a door, whether it's an actual one, an emotional one, a symbolic one, and, and, and left behind all that they have known so that they can live their own life as their own, own authentic self, then I believe a doll's house speaks to them and is about them. As Nora discovers in the original play and in its sequel, choosing to live life on one, one's own terms often comes with a personal and public price. While many cheer Nora's quest for self-actualization, others condemn her for breaking with traditional gender expectations. For the good of a higher ideal, Nora sacrificed her relationship with her family and lived a solitary life. The pursuit of personal and social justice is never easy, and progress can be slow, but Nora knows that pursuing it is necessary. As your character says in part two, this is my chance to change the rules. Because 20, 30 years from now, the world isn't going to be the kind of place I say it's going to be unless I'm the one to make it that way. For those that believe the fight for social justice is a noble, worthy, and necessary endeavor, we understand how difficult it is to make true and real change. But like Nora, we know this work must be done. So using our own voices, committing to taking action in our own ways, we can create a world wherein we uphold the ultimate human right, the right to live as our own authentic selves. Thank you so much for being here tonight for the lecture. I hope you will come see the play, and I hope you will commit. There are some cards over there that we've been handing out throughout this project in which we ask each person to think what can I do in my own individual life? With the words I say, the actions I take, the moments I choose to stand up and say the world can be different. The rules that we're living by are not right. They are wrong, and we can do it differently. We can do it better, and we can do it in a way in which we all can live with respect for each other and a sense that it's okay to say, this is who I am, this is my life, and these are the choices I am making. Again, thank you all for being here.